Hello, everybody. Father Stephen Imbrato, protestchildkilling.com, protestchildkilling.com. There's the link right there. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel and my Rumble channel. I want to thank you for joining us today. We're going to today go over or uh, revisit the Frank Pavone situation, the pro-life leader, Frank Pavone, formerly known as Father Frank Pavone. So we're going to revisit that situation I'm going to talk about that, but first I want to do my opening prayers as I normally do. And then also we are going to, I'm going to give you a little update on the camper and uh, how our Lord works. All right. So uh, let's start off with, as we normally do, invoking St. Michael, the archangel, defend us in battle, be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray, and do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. Now we consecrate ourselves to the Blessed Virgin Mary. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail, Holy Queen, Mother of mercy, our life, our sweetness, and our hope. To thee we cry, poor banished children of Eve. To thee we send up our sighs, mourning and weeping this valley of tears. Turn then, most gracious advocate, the eyes of mercy towards us. And after this, our exile, show unto us the blessed fruit of thy womb, Jesus. O clement, O loving, O sweet Virgin Mary, pray for us, O Holy Mother of God, that we may be made worthy of the promise of Christ. Let us pray. Remember, O most blessed Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who fled to thy protection, implored thy help, or sought thy intercession was left unaided. Inspire with this confidence, we fly unto thee, O Virgin of Virgins, our Mother. To you we come, before you we stand, sinful and sorrowful. O Mother, the Word incarnate, despise not our petitions, but in thy clemency, hear and answer us. Amen. Now, before we do the St. Joseph prayer, we're in the seventh day of our St. Joseph 18-day novena. Double novena, 18 days from the 1st to the 18th. Feast day of St. Joseph, spouse of Mary's on the 19th. My birthday, my birthday, a week from this coming Sunday. We're going to do the novena prayer. But first, I want to tell you about the camper. So, I didn't sell the camper. I want to thank Therese, who was willing to, Father, we'll, we'll, we'll buy you a new camper. Well, the issue wasn't that I needed a new camper. Uh, yes, this camper does need a little bit of work. It's not a lot of work. But I was trying to discern whether our Lord wanted me to sell the camper or not, based on the fact that I'm 71 years old, or I'm going to be 71, and, and how much am I going to go on the road with the chapel? And I left it in our Lord's hands. And at first, it looked like our Lord definitely wanted me to sell the camper because the price they were going to give me was uh, more than I expected. Well, it turns out that when I went online and I was trying to get an estimate for the for the value of the camper because I'm renewing my insurance policy today uh, for next year, okay? The, my truck, um, uh, a Mitsubishi car that I got my granddaughter, and the camper, okay? So my ministry pays for the camper and the truck, uh, and then uh, uh, I pay for the uh, Mitsubishi for my granddaughter. So anyway, the insurance company wanted a... Uh, an estimate on my camper, I had no idea, so I, I filled out this form online. Didn't know that it was one of these uh, collecting sites uh, where you give your information, then they, 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 they come and get you, right? And they came and got me, and I got several people who were interested in buying the camper, so I explored it. Well, it turns out that I put the wrong model number down, not be purposely, but because I didn't know what model number it was. I, I didn't want to, I didn't feel, feel it made any difference because I was just getting an insurance estimate. And, uh, well, it turns out that the model number I put in was the wrong model number and it jacked up the value of the camper. So the camper's not worth what I thought it was. So they weren't going to give me what I thought they were going to give me. And that was our Lord's way of saying, look, you keep the camper. I'll tell you when to get rid of it. And that's all well and good. Our Lord's will be done, right? That's it. We need to discern what does our Lord want. So that's the story of the camper. 
All right, so we're going to do the prayer to St. Joseph, and then we're going to revisit the Frank Pavone issue. I'm going to talk quite a bit about that, and then we're going to do some final prayers, but quite a bit about Frank Pavone uh, revisited. So the prayer to St. Joseph, the seventh day of the double novena. O oh, St. Joseph, whose protection is so great, so strong, so prompt before the throne of God, I place in you all my interests and desires. O oh, St. Joseph, do help me by your powerful intercession. Obtain for me from your divine Son all spiritual blessings through Jesus Christ our Lord, so that having engaged here below your heavenly power, I may offer my thanksgiving and homage to the most loving of fathers. O oh, St. Joseph, I never weary. Uh, contemplating you and Jesus asleep in your arms, I dare not approach while he reposes near your heart. Press him in my name and kiss his fine head for me and ask him to return the kiss when I draw my dying breath. St. Joseph, patron of the parting souls, pray for us. And of course, my brothers and sisters in Christ, my five primary intentions, three dear friends of mine, their relational intentions, health intentions, all of their intentions. And then... Uh, my personal intentions, which are my family intentions, my uh, extended, my, my family, my grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and then my, my uh, you, my, my social media family, uh, and uh, all those who pray for me, encourage me, support me, all the souls, of the, all, I mean, all those who I said that I pray for, including those I may forget to pray for, and then all my ministerial intentions. So this whole camper thing, started while we were praying on the road for life in the St. Joseph. So our Lord is at work. He's always at work. The Holy Spirit is always at work. If we're paying attention, we need to pay attention. Check out my Mass, my homily, and uh, also uh, Eucharistic Adoration from this morning. I was already up in St. Augustine, picked up the camp and brought it home. It's right outside. The chapel is right outside. So I got my St. Padre Pio Chapel here and my Mother Teresa mobile chapel right outside. All right, so Frank Pavone revisited. Now, I worked for Priest for Life for three and a half years, from June of 2015 till December, the end of December, actually early January 2019, but really for the most part, the end of uh, 2018, so for three and a half years. And uh, I could spend an hour, an hour and a half talking about my time with Priest for Life. It involved Red Rose Rescues. It involved the Presidential Executive Order on Personhood. Uh, Father Frank and I butted heads uh, many times over Red Rose Rescues, over the Presidential Executive Order on Personhood, both of those which I supported, and he didn't. And then his support of rape and incest exceptions on these bills without telling these, these legislative initiatives, without telling his donors, without telling the pro-life movement that there were rape and incest exceptions in a 20-week ban. And I had problems with that because I really feel we should be completely honest, uh, completely transparent, and tell people, look, if you're going to support this bill, you need to know all the facts about the bill. That number one, the bill's never going to be passed. Number two, there's rape and incest exceptions. Number three, we should not have rape and incest exceptions. We So I could go on and on and on about that. I could go on and on and on about his relationship with employees, with his relationship with the even the, um, the upper echelon uh, of uh, those in the ministry. Uh, but I'm not going to deal with that stuff right now. Uh, all right, so... Uh, I want to talk about uh, the Pavone. So anyway, last week, you guys know I was teasing you every single day. And, and I did a lot of research, 18, 19 articles. And for those of you who are watching this on YouTube, there should be links to several of the articles uh, below. All right. So uh, uh, they're not going to be on the YouTube version, but on the, I'm not, I'm sorry, they're not going to be on the Facebook version. They're going to be on the YouTube version, I'm pretty sure. But we're going to have three particular articles I want to reference here. And the reason why I guess our Lord wanted me to delay, or he delayed me in terms of revisiting this issue is because he knew, and I didn't, uh, that another article was going to come out, although I actually know the backstory to this article because I pretty much know what's going on with this issue. I'm an insider, 
All right. So so I know every aspect of this issue. I know every aspect of Priest for Life. Uh, I know the history of Priest for Life. I know the history of Frank Pabone. Uh, and so the pillar, the pillar Catholic came out with another article today that I uh, was not aware that the article was coming out, but I surely am aware of the backstory. A riff has emerged amongst pro-life leaders over Priest for Life director Frank Pabone, who has been accused of sexual misconduct. Several high-profile pro, uh, high pro-life leaders have withdrawn from a leadership group organized by Priests for Life, not originally organized by Priests for Life, but now is was re-energized and reorganized and run, oversaw uh, by Priests for Life. Amid ongoing fallout from allegations that Frank Pavone, the organizer's director, has groomed, right? I never used that word to me, uh, Sexual harassed, yes, classical workplace sexual harassment is what we're talking about. Four victims, four victims of classical workplace sexual harassment and manipulated several young women on his staff. All right, so uh, we know of two young, well, no, actually three young women, uh, Jen Morrison, Mary Worthington, and then um, uh, the, the victim that I counsel was older. She was older, okay? She wasn't in her 20s like these other three victims and then an unnamed victim. And there might be other victims because two people went to another priest who I know but has remained anonymous. Uh, and he counseled two women. Maybe one of them were these three uh, uh, younger women. Uh, we don't know. But at least four women have come forward. All right, and 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 we're gonna we're gonna get into that. All right, so uh, the pillar has confirmed that leaders from the Pro Life Action League, that's Eric Scheidler, American United for Life, that's Catherine Glenn Foster, Progressive Anti-Abortion Uprising, that is uh, Teresa Bukanovic, and other organizations have resigned from the 115 form, a semi-confidential, supposed to be a confidential alliance of pro-life strategists. I guess it's now semi-confidential because they uh, have named it, which includes both periodic meeting, uh, meetings and confidential email list server. That's right. Uh, it is confidential, an exclusive group, an elite group. All right. Uh, uh, I, since I left Priest for Life, uh, I was excluded from the group, all right, because I guess I'm a troublemaker, right? Uh, the 115 form is organized by uh, Priests for Life uh, and now at the center of scandal after several women have accused director Frank Pavona recently laicized priest of sexual and personal misconduct. Some pro-life leaders say the scandal has had ripple effects a rift that has emerged amongst pro-life campaigners over the place of over the place of Frank Pavone, Priest for Life organization within the pro-life movement. Eric Scheidler has come out. And he's the focal point of this article from Pillar Catholic. All right, on February 9th, the day after Pillar reported its second story about women who accused Pavone of misconduct, Scheidler wrote to members of the 115 form. I'm well aware of that. I'm well aware of all these exchanges on the 115 form, even though I'm not included. People from the 115 form forward these to me because they know where I stand in this particular issue. And about two weeks ago, Eric called me himself to get an affirmation from me that everything that he discovered on his own, apart from me, but him reading the articles, and you'll find out from reading Father Frank's a transparency that he came to an understanding that there's something seriously wrong with the Priest for Life organization, Father Frank, the laization, the, the prolonged disobedience, and his conduct towards these women, and his 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 resulting response to these women and to the disobedience, the long-term disobedience to the whole, the whole shebang, the whole issue. His response is, and I've been, I've been talking about this, these non-denial denials, him claiming that everybody else is printing falsehoods, saying falsehoods, inaccuracies without him 
ever mentioning one specific one. He's never mentioned a specific inaccuracy. He has said, all right, that no one has ever spayed, uh, gotten special compensation for what has happened to them. And maybe not special compensation. Well, how do you define special compensation? We know two women, two women were kept on the payroll uh, for a long time, uh, uh, months, uh, one many months, uh, one a few months, all right, uh, and, and were paid. And, and an independent priest who found out about this said, well, sounds like compensation to me. It sounds like a payoff to me, and that's exactly what it was. And I know that to be a case because that's how Anthony DiStefano and uh, the whole system works. Uh, you just we just keep you on the payroll and you have a, a, a no show paid job with benefits. Now, the donors need to know this stuff, right, to know that your donation money is going to fund these types of compensations. Hey, and that's what this is all about. So people ask me all the time, Father, why do you care? Why do you care? Well, first of all, I'm hard, hardwired to stand up against injustice. I counseled one of the women who were was the victim of this classical sexual harassment uh, uh, in the workplace. Uh, and uh, she's upset that Father Frank is playing the victim. As I, you'll find out, Eric Scheidler saying the same thing. And I kind of like planted that seed in Eric Scheidler that really if Frank Pavone upon being laicized, just said, well, you know what? I've had problems with the bishops for so long. I'm going to accept this for the time being. I'm going to appeal to Rome behind the scenes. I'm going to run priest for life as a lay person. But no, from the time this has gone on, day one, he's played the victim. Woe is me. I'm the victim. They're persecuting me. They're aborting me, right? Uh, they don't like me. They're doing it because of my pro-life work. All these lies... Uh, all these falsehoods that he's putting out, all right, ignoring the fact that seven years he was disobedient and really blaming his bishop for his disobedience. And we're going to find out uh, that that is also uh, a serious falsehood. All right, so uh, this is Eric Scheidler. The allegations of sexual misconduct, which have not been denied by Frank or anyone at Priest for Life, that's correct, Despite ample opportunities to do so, make it untenable for him to continue leading the forum or priest for life. So Eric is now calling for his resignation. All right. Uh, 150, I'm sorry, not a priest for life of the forum of priest for life. Shiloh told the group he had other reasons for resigning from the forum as well. My decision is not based solely on the sexual misconduct allocations which many here appear too willing to dismiss, and that's true. Uh, and we've seen that from the very beginning, uh, the, the, the comments, the hits that I have taken, uh, people attacking me, all right, for just standing up for the truth, standing up for injustice, standing up for the integrity of the priesthood. And that's it. I'm standing up for the pro-life movement, for injustices against these women, and the integrity of the priesthood. That's it. Right. Uh, I believe the way Frank and Priest for Life have handled and it is Priest for Life. Believe me, Janet Morana, Anthony DiStefano. All right. And we have a board issue, a board of directors issue. All right. I'm going to get to that in a little while, too. I believe the way Frank and Priest for Life have handled the conflict with his bishop, ultimately leading to his laicization this past November, has been profoundly irresponsible and in doing real harm to the pro-life movement and to the church. Father Dennis Wilde and I sat down with Frank Pavone at least on, on at least one occasion and implored him, implored him to go to his bishop and talk to his bishop and say one thing. How can we work this out? What can we work out where I continue to head priest for life and still be in your good graces. I'm not going to give him the time of day is the response that we got from Frank. He was uh, uh, belligerent. He calls uh, his bishop belligerent. I've seen Frank Pavone belligerent when it comes to the bishop. Now, 
You can say, well, he has every right to be belligerent towards his bishop because his bishop's belligerent towards him. I'm sorry, bishop, priest, bishop, priest. I've had disagreements with my bishops over the years, the bishop who ordained me and also uh, my current bishop. And I'll tell you what, none of them were hills I wanted to die on. And I acquiesced. On a couple of occasions, we no negotiated something that uh, they were comfortable with and I was comfortable with. But if they were adamant and drew a line, I would have obeyed. I would have obeyed, but not Frank Pavone. And the line was that he was going to run this ministry no matter what. If you didn't like it, he wasn't going to hear it. And if you read everything that he says, every, every, every time he talks about it, you can see that's the underlying issue. A vocation within a vocation. He was ordained for this ministry. Well, no, I'm sorry. You don't decide that. Your vocation is a calling from God, and the way you know your calling is from God, and you're discerning what God wants, you're doing what God wants, it's through your rightful superior, all right? And we've had, we're going to find out that he had ample opportunity to get out. He says that Zerk wouldn't let him out. Well, the facts seem to point to something a little bit different. Now he's blaming, I just read yesterday, he's blaming the congregation for the doctrine of the faith or the clergy. One of those two, uh, uh, Vatican, that they would, they reneged on a deal. Hey, everybody's reneging on the deal, right? Zork is a bad guy. The congregations in Rome are bad guys where he originally said that Rome loved him. Rome was supporting him, right, etc. Well, they turned against him too. Why? Because enough is enough. Seven and a half years of obstinance, abject disobedience, refusing to, to even communicate with your bishop, he even admits, told me, I'm not going to give him the time of day. We're not, I'm not going to respond to his communications, all right? And we're going to get to all of this, all right? I might have to do part one and part two, but uh, we'll see. What I, so anyway, what's interesting is that Eric read all of the reports uh, and the media reports, and he took Father Frank at his word, and he went to frfrankpavone.com, I believe it is. It's Father Frank's transparency website, and I did too. And there's holes in that website that you could drive trucks through. And I encourage everyone to go and read the website because there is a lot of stuff missing, a lot of questions unanswered, uh, and... Uh, uh, no explanation given. And so listen to this. What I find, it, so Shiloh told the group of members he had carefully reviewed the records Pavone made available on his own website. What I find in that history, the history that Frank invited us to review, is a continuous pattern of delay, obfuscation, uh, equivocation, creation of chaos and confusion, always a new demand for another meeting, another clarification, and ultimately an utter unwillingness to ever take responsibility. Boom. Boom. And Eric Scheidler told me it was his research on Father Frank's website that Father Frank wanted everybody to go to that brought him to that point. And that paragraph right there is one big boom, everybody. You read Father Frank. You listen carefully to Father Frank. And you can say he does protest too much. But you start listening and you hear his abject uh, defiance of his bishop. You get the whole picture if you ponder it in your heart. The non-denial denials about what, what uh, 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 happened with these women. The fact that Everyone else is full of inaccuracies and falsehoods, but we're supposed to just believe everything that he says. In fact, it's the same pattern of behavior we have seen since the laization was made public late last year, especially since the allegations of sexual misconduct arose. All right, Shiloh then resigned from the group. Uh, 
I tried for weeks to hold priests for life accountable for all the obfuscation, confusion, and lack of transparency on both the issue of Pavone's laization and the issue of sexual misconduct. Scheidler said, and I got nowhere. I tried to demand answers, and I wasn't getting them. All right, so let me tell you a story, uh, a recent story, okay? In the middle of Father Frank wanting platforms for his narrative, so immediately after the laization started, uh, Frank did the, uh, the, the uh, what do you want to call it, the, uh, the circuit, the circuit, right? Uh, LifeSite News gave him a platform so he could put his narrative out there without response. Taylor Marshall has had him on twice, giving him the opportunity to put his narrative out there without without response, without challenge. Uh, neither of them ever challenging his non-denial denials, his his generalities about falsehoods and inaccuracies, right? They don't challenge him about uh, the, the, the fact that he was uh, laicized because he was pro-life, not having to do anything with disobedience. No challenges whatsoever. Taylor Marshall, LifeSite News, right? Just more recently, CPAC, right? Uh, but many, many platforms, and, and Frank took advantage of every platform he could to go out there and put his narrative out. All right, so meanwhile, meanwhile, I am giving background to Christine Niles of Church Militant, and I, I, in full disclosure, I have given a one-day retreat to Church Militant. Uh, I have had an association now since August, a good association with Church Militant. I've met with Mike Morris. Uh, I've come to understand him, uh, surely respect him, respect greatly Christine Niles. Uh, and so I was giving her some background and they actually published an article. And then also they published uh, Andrew Smith, a board member, and my statements, the joint statements that came out. But anyway, uh, Frank Pavone got in touch with Church Militant because him and Mike uh, Boris went to the seminary together. And Pavone wanted a platform on uh, Church Militant, again, to give his narrative, right? And uh, uh, Christine was hesitant to do that. She was hesitant to do that because she just didn't want to give him a platform. She wanted to do a real interview because she's a real journalist. She's good at her job. She's very good at her job. And she's a prayerful woman. She's a, a woman who believes in justice, right? So uh, they held off. And then the one article came out and Father Frank realized that he was not going to get just an easy platform to put out his narrative that he'd have to sit down and actually be challenged and answer questions. And that from that point on, he refused. He refused to have an interview by Church Milton. What does that tell you? He's never been challenged. He has never allowed himself to be challenged. He has never allowed himself to be asked the tough questions. He is completely, totally controlled the narrative. Why? Because he knows he's guilty of abject disobedience for seven plus years, that he's done a lot of things he shouldn't have done in that period of time, the baby on the altar, and then, of course, the whole political stuff. And, you know, not to minimize, he minimizes the tweets. If you really read all the tweets and the language, cursing, using God's name in vain, cursing. And I remember, and, and I'm telling you what, I have seen him drop the F-bomb so many times and seen and heard him drop the F-bomb so many times, uh, it, it, it makes me shudder. All right, I don't remember the circumstances, but I know in written form and also I've heard it orally. Um, so... Uh, so we shouldn't minimize the whole blasphemy thing, even though I think it's probably the, the, the least significant part of this issue. I think the laization because of the abject long-term disobedience 
and now the uh, 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 classic sexual harassment in the workplace uh, for uh, allegations from four different women, uh, different allegations from four different women against him. All right, and then really just the complete and total dishonesty, which Eric Scheidler talks about. So I got nowhere. I tried to demand answers. I was getting none. All right, and he makes the good point. I'm not suggesting there were mistakes made by the bishops along the way. I agree. I'll give you one. All right, uh, the letter that came from the Vatican, I guess I was still there. It might have been 2017, 2018. Uh, the Vatican said that uh, uh, that priests for life should change canonically how they label their organization because originally it was an, uh, an organization for priests, a Catholic organization for priests, but then it became ecumenical and very diverse. And uh, the Vatican in that, in that letter was not critical at all. Cardinal Dolan took that letter and totally, completely misconstrued the letter to a, le and a letter to his priest, saying that in the letter he sent out to all of his priests, uh, that uh, priests for life had lost their canonical standing. That was not true. So just to show you, all right, that I am not uh, completely against Frank Pavone and completely on the side of bishops. I agree with uh, Eric Scheidler that uh, the bishops have made mistakes. I mean, not publishing everything, leaving the narrative up to Pavone and, un and as an unanswered narrative. Scheidler charged we were flat out lied to about such matters as to whether Frank had faculties. That's absolutely true. I was under the impression that he had faculties. I found out probably in the beginning of uh, sometime in 2016, maybe the latest 2017, that he hadn't had faculties to, since probably 2015. Or let me put it this way, that he had faculties, but that they were limited. He wasn't allowed on, on uh, EWTN. And that his faculties were that he could continue to do priest for life work and that it was up to each bishop to decide whether they wanted Frank Pavone to come into their diocese or restrict him in their diocese. Okay, that turned out to be not true. Eventually, his celebrate, which was expired, uh, I think February of 2016, his celebrate expired. It was eventually replaced. That expired celebrate was on his website for a long time. It was eventually replaced with Frank Pavone. Father Frank Pavone is in good standing with a letter from Dave Dibel, his canonical lawyer, claiming that there was a letter from Rome stating that Frank Pavone was in good standing. The letter from Rome was not on the website, just a letter from Dibel stating there was a letter from Rome stating that Frank was in good standing. So we don't know, okay? But this is the obfuscation uh, that Eric is talking about. I've been in numerous meetings only to find out now that he was not supposed to be celebrating mass. He was not supposed to be wearing that Roman collar, etc. It was just a, ca a callous disregard for the effect of his power struggle within the hierarchy would have had the rest of the pro-life movement. So very interesting. Um, Brad Mattis of Life Issues or Life Institute. Uh, he came out with a statement that was originally on the Priest for Life website in support of Father Frank. Brad is one of those pro-life leaders. He's not mentioned in the article, but I know for a fact he was one of the pro-life leaders who resigned from the 115 forum. And his letter of support for Father Frank is no longer available on Father Frank's website, or you can click on it and it goes to a dead link, which means that Brad took it off of his uh, website. So uh, he's one more. Uh, with sincere regret, we must inform you that Americans United for Life is withdrawing from the 115 forum. Uh, that is Catherine Glenn Foster. She did not want to be named. All right, other people are named here. 
quite a few people have now distanced themselves. Some of them have come out and distanced themselves. Many have not, and that is dealt with in the article too. Another pro-life leader said Pavone's allegation might foster a Me Too moment in the pro-life movement and a more explicit recognition that we're a woman's first movement being uh, because being pro-life means being pro-women. While some leaders have distanced themselves from Pavone, a segment of the movement insists on blind adherence to a man who refuses to deal with repeated credible allegations of sexual harassment. Terry Gessimer, Father Terry Gessimer, Troy Newman are sticking by him, right? Uh, uh, Troy called me small and petty, all right, because of things that I have said. Well, I'm not going to comment on how many times I have uh, heard, seen comments by Troy Newman that are small and petty. But the fact of the matter is, false loyalties, uh, uh, why? Why these people stick with them? Long-term friendships, long-term allegiances, I have no idea. Maybe there's money going from priests for life to these organizations. I have no idea. Somebody else alludes to that, all right? Shiloh confirmed that some pro-life leaders have defended Pavone uh, and called into question the veracity of allegations against him. So a lot of people say, well, why did it take so long for Jen Morrison and Mary Worthington and, and this other anonymous gal to come forward, right? Why? And then you see the criticism that was put forth against these women, charges of them lying, them lying and criticizing, why didn't they come out you know, before, and then you wonder why women don't come out, right? Because women come out, and in 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 in, a, in most difficult circumstances, uh, and again, we're talking about a high-profile pro-life leader here. These women admit how difficult it was for them to come forward, and yet. They are faced with criticisms and allegations that they're lying. Why did they stay so long? Why did they endure this for so long? Then you wonder why women don't come out. Right? No, I, I, I'm proud of these women that have come out. And especially Mary Worthington putting her name on it. Jen Morrison putting her name on it. Now, Eric Scheidler, thank you for putting your name on it. You know, Frank brought these sexual misconduct allegations to the forefront by his own shameful effort to cast himself as the victim of his laization. All right, so this is important. I talked to Eric about this. I said from the very beginning, and I said it in this broadcast, that if he had just accepted the laization and said, I understand I've had a long history of problems with the bishops, I accept the laization. I am going to work behind the scenes to, to uh, get my priesthood back. In the meantime, as a lay person, I'm going to run Priest for Life. It's primarily a lay organization, multi-ministry, high generating revenue organization, multi-million dollars. I mean, up to $15 million. I think one year they hit $15 million. I'm going to run the organization. And he just did that. We wouldn't be at this point. We wouldn't be here. But it was him from the very beginning claiming that he's a victim. He's the victim. He's being aborted. He's being persecuted. He's being mistreated. When he knows that he's mistreated people out there, of course the victims are going to come forward. And now, what's going to happen? He risks losing it all. I told Troy Newman that. Told him more than once. I actually sent text messages in the very beginning to Anthony DiStefano telling him, don't do this. Don't let him play the victim. No, nope, no, nope. not Frank Pavone style. He's going to play the victim. He's going to play the man. He's going to be the one who stands up to these big bad bishops. 
All right, and he's going to pay the consequences, or he's paying the consequences now. All right, in reference to a tweet after the disembolization, which Pavone said he'd been treated like the unborn, Shiloh said he was profoundly offended. And that's a good point, Derek, right? These babies uh, get sucked out of their mother's womb using vacuum suction machines and scalpels. The comparison is absurd and offensive. All right, Pavone has not been in any way uh, uh, persecuted or punished other than being stripped of his priesthood and, and could have run a multi-million dollar uh, uh, organization, right? Uh, uh, right? And still been a leader in the pro-life movement. All right, so these people are coming forward saying, waiting, I'm a victim, all right? So that came out in Eric and I's talk. All right, so then there's a reference to me and Andrew, both a former board member and former staffer for Priest for Life, have called for Pavone to resign and the organization to commission an investigation. All right, so let me, let me bring some uh, points up here. What do we have? We have four victims alleging misconduct, classic sexual harassment in the workplace against Frank Pavone. We have two priests. Myself, another priest who remains anonymous. We have a board member who is always in good standing with Priest for Life, who's a long-term employee and then a board member. And then we have leaders of the pro-life movement who read what Father Frank put out of Listen to Father Frank and all of them said enough, basta, enough, Right? I don't see how anyone looking at the long-term abject disobedience, his attitude towards the laization, his non-denial denials of uh, uh, everything, the, the media reports, the allegations, him claiming that there's falsehoods and, and, and uh, inaccuracies without ever naming a specific one. I don't see any reasoned person come to an understanding of anything other than there's something seriously wrong here and it lies at the feet of Frank Pavone. Staff members of some other pro-life organizations have told the pillow that leaders and organizations are concerned about the prospect of retribution from Pavone if they raise concerns. The former priest has a large social media platform and a strong fundraising operation. This guy, somebody's saying this, right? right? This guy is a lot more powerful and a lot more influential than you're giving him credit for a staffer at one pro-life organization who was not authorized to speak on the record, told the pillar. For his part, Shiler acknowledged that there could be a cost in him speaking out. All right, and then he goes into certain associations that they've had. And then the pillar goes into... All right, so anyway, so then Leslie Palmer, who's a, a, a Priest for Life communication director, who I know very, very well, uh, her statement, she issues the statement, and it's the official statement, the false accusations and vitriol of recent statements. Now, Frank Pavone has uttered falsehoods. And I'm going to get to those. And the vitriol of recent statements. Well, the things that he has said about his bishop and the bishops and the pope and everybody being against them, right? Right? And then calling everybody else, right? Liars. The false accusations. Hey, you're all liars. You're all liars. Are truly unfortunate. Yeah, they make him sad. That's the term. We're saddened by, right? And Priest for Life has not contributed to encourage our supporters to respond in kind. Well, Frank, you have. All right? Shiloh says, I think this kind of dishonesty is really going to be bad for our movement. All right, and then they go into the history. 
of uh, the allegations against him, the disobedience. So it's all very well documented. Again, this is Pillar Catholic. It just came out today. These victims, so two of the victims have said that they filed complaints against Pavone with applicable diocese, and they were not taken care of to their satisfaction. Pavone says that all of these situations were taken care of to the satisfaction of everyone. Well, th that's not true because obviously the victims are not satisfied. Now, again, this is a, s a situation where indeed maybe the, the diocese are somewhat at fault. We're not addressing these allegations properly, not dealing with these allegations at the time, or we don't know what they did or didn't do. Maybe they did try to deal with them, and Pavone just said, hey, look it, I'm not doing anything. Now, it it's, seems to be true that Zurich from Amarillo gave Frank two Letters of Good Standing, I think 2010 and 2014. And Frank has used those as uh, a way of defending himself against the allegations of the one unnamed gal and Mary Worthington. All right, saying, see, these have been investigated. These have been resolved. I have these letters of good standing. Okay. All right. So let's give him that. Let's give him that. Well, then, that was 2010, 2014. Pavone has made it clear that from the very beginning, from the very beginning, he's had problems with Zorik. From the very beginning, Zorik has not been a father to him, has treated him badly, has persecuted him, right? Uh, well, it seems like if he gave him letters of good standing, and at one point said, uh, something positive about him, right? And I think it was in and around during that period of time. It seemed like Zurich was trying to be reasonable. Then all of a sudden things changed. What could have changed? Well, maybe Zurich said, look it, I'm sorry, but I'm tired of the disobedience. I'm tired of you just doing what you want to do and not obeying me. And as a matter of fact, that came out. I think it's on Father Frank's website. It came out that I'm just tired of this disobedience. You're incorrigible, Frank. Can't talk to you. Now, Now Pavone says that there's no talking to Zorik. And Zorik says that Pavone's not accepting any communications. Well, if you go to Father Frank's website, it's clear that Father Frank said, don't contact me anymore. No more communications. You're harassing me. You're persecuting me. No more communications. He's a priest. This guy's a bishop. I, I, I don't get that. Who are you to tell your bishop that he can't send you communications, especially when there's a, 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 a process going on where they're investigating your disobedience, maybe investigating other things like your blasphemy, maybe these allegations of misconduct. And they're sending you communications and you're not responding to them. You're saying, don't you dare send me communications. Then there's a trial. You're found guilty. It's an appeal process that you know about. See, I was in a meeting and I believe it was 2017. It might be 2018. I have notes from the meeting. Um, where Father Frank announced to everybody that Zorik going to lay aside him. It's going to lay aside him. And uh, uh, that's serious stuff. So if, if, if Frank was getting communications, he was receiving communications, he was getting communications from Zork that he was going to get lay aside. And I think it was 2017 after the baby on the altar thing. Well, then he's picking and choosing what he's going to respond to, what he's not going to respond to, what he's going to obey and what he's not going to obey. Right. He responded to his rightful superiors saying you are to leave Trump's advisory board, the two advisory boards. He responded to the burying of the baby. I'm not absolutely sure the baby is buried, 
But he responded to that. Yet Jerry Horn contacted me to arrange to have the baby buried. And I had the baby, I had the arrangement to have the baby buried. I set up Jerry Horn. I don't know for sure that the baby is buried. All right? So, uh, uh, he responded to some communications. He obeyed some, disobeyed others, all right? And again, this is what Eric said. If you go through Pavone's transparency page and you read everything and you click on all the links and you start getting the full picture, you can see that there's a serious, serious problem here. All right, so uh, this long, long article talks about Worthington and the other gal at length. They rehash that, Jennifer Morse, uh, and then talks about not, not just Jennifer Morrison, but uh, uh, Jennifer Roback Morse, all right, published an article last month. Now, I want to I want to talk about this. Sources say that Pavone took a backseat at a February meeting of the 115 Forum, which the former cleric ordinarily led personally. Sources say that during the meeting, Priest for Life Director Janet Morana said that Pavone had the support of the organization's board and would continue in his leadership. Now, I went looking for the current board members. Now, the Priest for Life website is hard to navigate. It's very hard to navigate. But I found everything. I found the board of advisors, the clerical board of advisors, the staff, pastoral team, and, and it said board of directors. I could not find a board of directors. I don't know who the board of directors are. I don't know how big the board is. I think, and my understanding is that the board of directors basically are have deep relationships with Frank Pavone. There's not anybody independent. See, when I was there, there was a 13 member board and some of them were independent of the organization sitting on the board for different reasons. So my question is, who's on the board now? But more importantly, what happened to the sexual harassment committee? Is there a sexual harassment committee within the Priest for Life organization? If there is, who sits on that committee? Is it independent? Is it confidential? Is it safe? There's no human resource department, none whatsoever, unless one's been formed since I left. But to my knowledge, no human resource department. One of the big problems I had back when I was there, no human resources, Frank Pavone, Mark Belonzo, and this gal named Chrissy were the sexual harassment committee. Surely not independent. Surely not confidential. Surely not safe for any employee who's being harassed to go forward with complaints of harassment. The board before I left and after they set up this independent, safe, confidential uh, board, that's when I resigned. But what's happened since then? That was the beginning of 2019. We're now three years later, four years later, 20, 21, 22, four years later. Is there a board? Are the employees, do they have a safety net? Do they have someplace confidential to go with complaints within the organization? Those are legitimate questions, I think. All right, I want to talk about an article from 2020, my son's birthday, September 17, 2020. All right, it's by CNA, all right, and the CNA staff. The Diocese of Amarillo has spoken out about election-related comments from Father Frank Pavone, National Director of Pro-Life Group Priest for Life, and asked for prayers for the priest. Asked for prayers. For the priest, this is 2017. In a September 16th statement, the diocese noted that Pavone, in videos posted online, had condemned the act of voting for candidates of a particular party, 
particular political party and had reportedly suggested he might need to refuse absolution if such votes were confessed with contrition. With contrition. All right. According to the diocese, Pavone also used scandalous words not becoming of a Catholic priest. These posts are not consistent with Catholic Church teaching, meaning that he would refuse to give absolution to people who supported a particular party. Canon law forbids clerics from having an active role in political parties unless they receive permission of their bishop. Now, did he receive permission beforehand, before he got on these advisory boards? No. No, he even admits it. Although he has since stepped down from the two positions at the request of a competent ecclesiastical authority, he still has maintained public support. But I don't care about that, uh, him supporting Trump. I don't care about that. In tweets that were subsequently deleted, Pavone last weekend reportedly called Democratic pre presidential nominee Joe Biden an expletive loser. He cursed and said the Democratic Party was God-hating and America-hating. And that Biden supporters can't say a blank thing in support, and, and this is a curse, in support of their loser candidate without using the word Trump. What the hell do you have to say for yourselves, losers? Now, he says that he subsequently apologized and went to confession. All right, Frank, well... You got contrition. You apologize. We're supposed to forgive you. You went to confession. With contrition, you were absolved. But you won't absolve people who vote for a particular party, even though they come to you contrite? No, the, the, the diocese is right. That's behavior on becoming a priest. That's an attitude, a mindset that's on becoming a priest. As a diocesan statement indicated, Pavone also reported, tweeted, he would hear the confession of a Catholic who votes Democrat, but were trained that in the absence of repentance, absolution has to be held, has to be withheld. All right, so that seems to be a contradictory statement, but that's actually, all right. Uh, but he's, he, but we as priests, all right, can't make the determination that there's no contrition. If the penitent says, I'm not sorry, I committed these sins and I'm not sorry, that's a different story. But they come into the confession by the nature of them confessing with evidence, no evidence to the contrary, we give absolution. Asked by CNA in April whether he had obtained permission from his bishop to officially campaign for Trump's re-election, Pavone would not answer directly. He said he had not been forbidden from doing so and that the communication with his bishop was a dysfunctional process. Your fault or his fault? I think by your own admission, you, you were at fault as much as he was. And he's the bishop, you're the priest. But he's saying that he had not been forbidden from doing so, but did he ask for permission? That is the old adage, right, that as a Catholic, it's easier to ask for forgiveness than it is to ask for permission. I guess that's what he's alluding to, right? Right? That, hey, I'm just going to go and do it, even though I need I, I need to ask for permission. I'm not going to ask for permission. I'm going to go do it. And then when they tell me I can't do it, I'll just stop doing it, right? And he claims that he was obedient. He was obedient. All right, then we get to the to the video on the altar. Well, I will tell you this, all right? And they accused him against it. So, so Zurich uh, calling it against the dignity of human life and a desecration of the altar, adding that the action and presentation of Pavone in this video is not consistent with the beliefs of the Catholic Church. Look it, there's varying opinions on this issue, but the fact that it matters two things about the altar and the baby. All right. I celebrated mass on that altar at least a dozen times in the three and a half years. I have been there when masses have been celebrated on that altar, probably 
I'll say at least 75 times in the three and a half years. So I either celebrated Mass or was present when Mass was celebrated on that altar. I never saw that altar used for anything else other than an altar. So we can split hairs as to whether it was a consecrated altar or not. But believe me, all those masses celebrated all those years on the altar. All right. Was the altar, altar desecrated? Well, that's a question that you need to come to grips with. But the fact of the matter is to say that it was not an altar is disingenuous. The baby. Read Mary Pizzullo's article. I'm going to include it. All right. Decades of baby choice. I'm going to include it as one of the articles linked here. Read it. She does an exhaustive research article on the history of the baby. All right. And she points out many contradictions in Frank Pavone's story about the baby. Pavone said he'd done similar things before that. Would I do it again? Absolutely. So here is his obstinance, right? His bishop is telling him this is a problem. I'll do it again. I'll do it again. All right, then they go into the history of Pavone and his uh, priesthood, uh, how he was uh, uh, given by the Archdiocese of New York, plans to become a pro-life religious order of priest. The dispute between uh, Pavone and Zurich uh, became public in 2011. In April, the priest said, told uh, CNA that his relationship with Zurich remained rocky, and that he was in the process. Okay, so this is important stuff. In 2011, the dispute between Pavone and Zurich became public after the priest was recalled to the diocese and suspended by the bishop. Pavone appealed to the Vatican and suspension was eventually lifted in 2012. In April, the priest told CNA that his relationship with Zurich remained cocky. So this was April of 2020. 2020. April of 2020. The Diocese of Amarillo has not responded to repeated requests from CNA for clarity about Pavone's political activity or ecclesiastical status, including a request to clarify whether he has faculties to minister publicly as a priest. Pavone told CNA in July that it remains incarnated in the Amarillo Diocese. But my transfer has been canonically completed. This is a quote from Pavone. But my transfer has been canonically completed to a different bishop who has good will towards me and my work. He declined to name that diocese, saying that the announcement of what diocese I am now in is up to the same ecclesiastical authority to make. Pavone sort of trans... So that, that, all right, that is, he told CNA that in 2020, that it's a done deal. It's a done deal. Why did it ever happen? Why didn't it ever happen? It was a done deal. Well, well, it was another. In 2016, he sought a transfer to the Diocese of Colorado. Asked by CNA in April if his pending transfer was to that diocese, he would not say. The diocese told CNA that then, then that Bishop Michael Sheridan had not received information from the Vatican indicating that Pavone was being transferred there. All right, so Sheridan didn't know anything about it. So we have two instances that seem to be huge contradictions, seem to be huge discrepancies in what exactly is going on. On one hand, Pavone has said that, that Zork would not let him transfer. On Pavone's website, there's a letter from the Vatican saying that indeed, Pavone could transfer, but it's up to the bishop totally. And Sheridan's mentioned actually several times in the one letter. It's up to Sheridan. It's up to Sheridan. It's up to Sheridan. But Sheridan says he doesn't know anything about it. Then there was another bishop, and that never materialized. So what was going on? What was going on? Here, here's what I think was going on. When these bishops found out exactly what was going on, 
And what Father Frank wanted, because this is what he wanted. He wanted a transfer into a diocese. And I heard him say this more than once when I was there. He wanted to transfer into a diocese that the bishop would allow him to continue run priest for life and then also have autonomy to find a way to start either a secular society of the faithful. Right? Again, I don't know the canonical names, but he wanted to be under a bishop who would allow him just to do whatever he wanted. Hey, you want to be on Trump's advisory boards? No problem. You want to do the baby on the altar thing? No problem. You want to uh, 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 blur sexual guidelines with your employee? No problem. Just do whatever you want to do. Whatever you want to do, right? And this is not the way Catholicism works. This, this can't be, right? All right. So, so that's, uh, that's that. Now, I have one other article... Again, and this is the article from the National Catholic Register about my uh, former priest for life officials call for Bavone to step down. Uh, I do believe that he needs to resign now. I really do. All right, before I would have said, and again, I said it very clearly, uh, I would have been fine with him as a lay person running priest for life for the good of the movement, for the good of the babies, all right, for the good of priest for life. But now... I don't see any recourse. But the decision is up to the donors. And Pavone says this. This is not just up to Rome, he claims, or the rightful authorities, the Episcopal authorities, he claims. It's up to the people. Well, that's not true. That's not Catholic. But in reality, he's correct. Because whether he stays as head of priest for life is up to the donors. And people have criticized me for coming forward. But as a member of the pro-life movement, I feel an obligation to all those pro-life people who are contributing, donating to the goodwill of the movement. And Eric Scheidler is, 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 is making, has uh, made allusions to that. We do our ministry because of the goodwill of the people. And the people, and this is why I got in trouble with Father Frank back in 2017, when he's telling people, you got to support these bills, but he's not talking about the rape and incest or, or the, the, the different aspects of these bills. He's not being honest with his donors. I had a big problem with that. Now we need to be completely honest. We need to be completely transparent. And Pavone has not been. And he's not being transparent. The donors have a right to know. And then let them decide. You want to continue donating to Priest for Life? God bless you. But you need to know the facts. I encourage you, read all the articles that are out there. I'm going to put several as links on this YouTube video. And then read, and again, I'll put the link all right, to uh, Frank Pavone's transparency page. Read his page. Read his page. He's inviting you. I'm inviting you. I got nothing to hide. Read and then ponder all things like the Blessed Mother. I'm challenging Frank Pavone, challenging Anthony DiStefano. I'm, I'm challenging uh, uh, Janet Morano. If you're going to criticize me, be specific. Where am I lying? Where am I being inaccurate? What are the falsehoods? Be specific. What are they? I could have said things today that are mistaken, that are mistaken, because there's so much information there, so much information out there. Eric, Sh uh, Eric Scheidler alludes to that so much that I could be mistaken, get my facts mixed up. But what are the specific falsehoods? Mary Worthington, what are the falsehoods in her story? The other gal, what are the falsehoods in her story? Where are the falsehoods in CNA's articles, Church Militant's articles, uh, EW10's article, National Catholic Register's articles, Pillar Catholic articles? What? Where are they? And finally, Frank Pavone, how about sitting down with Christine Niles from Church Militant? How about sitting down with her and letting her interview, letting her challenge you? 
letting you letting her ask you about these contradictions, about your non-denial denials, about these falsehoods, these inaccuracies that you are uh, uh, complaining about. Let her ask you about those. And then let the people decide. Let this interview be public. Let, let, let the people decide. Sit down and be interviewed in a platform that's not just you putting your narrative out there without any response or challenge because that's the way it's been. That's the way it's been. And that's what you want. And you don't even personally answer these allegations. You, you give out press releases. Press releases. And again, for those who want to criticize me, for coming out publicly, I have an obligation to stand up for injustice, for the integrity of the movement, and the integrity of the priesthood. That's it. You want to criticize me? Well, that's fine. That's fine. But if you're going to criticize me, tell me the specific falsehood, the specific inaccuracy, the specific contradiction. And I'll answer them. I'll answer any challenge against me that is specific. All right, let's pray. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. Let's pray for all bishops and priests, the Pope, bishops and priests. Father in heaven, we thank you for your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, who through his death and resurrection has given us the hope of eternal happiness with you, Father. Send your Holy Spirit upon the Pope, all bishops and all priests, that they may be for us bold witnesses of faithful love for the church. Remain for us examples of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. St. Joseph, St. Stephen, uh, intercede for the Pope. St. Felicity, St. Perpetua, intercede for the Pope, all bishops and all priests, especially in our hour of need. Our Lady of Guadalupe, intercede for the conversion of the world and the end to abortion. Amen. Say a Hail Mary for the pro-life movement, Frank Pavone and all leaders in the movement. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Mary, undoer of knots, pray for us. Mary, seat of wisdom, pray for us. Blessed Mother, we ask you for the humility and the strength to ponder all things in our heart. And in pondering all things in our heart, this vast amount of information, this uh, vast amount of, of just uh, narrative that is out there, to be able to sort through it, ponder it. Our Lord's will be done. You told us, do as he tells you. We desire to do our Lord's will. Lord, show us your will and give us the strength to do your will. And we ask this through the intercession of all the angels, martyrs, and saints in the name of the father the son the holy spirit amen all right my brothers and sisters in christ uh thank you for joining me today i love you just pray for me i'll pray for you this is much longer and maybe a lot more voluminous than i wanted it to be uh but again there's so much so much information i encourage you do your own research do your own reading ponder all things in your heart come up with your own conclusion God's will be done. Let's do all things for his praise, honor, and glory. May Almighty God bless you all, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Go out into the world today, my friends, and give them heaven.